tell me about the OK Corral. OK, well, um, eh, I see what you did there. What? You said OK. Oh, well, there we go. All right. I watched My Darling Clementine, which is about Wyatt Earp and Doc and, Holliday. And it's what I call My Little Chickadee. Yes. Evidently, John Ford, when he was a young man, met a very old Wyatt Earp. And Wyatt Earp told him this is how the OK Corral happened. And it's supposed to be the most historically accurate gunfight of the OK Corral. And not to give away any spoilers, in this version, Doc Holliday dies. Which, he doesn't die at the OK Corral. I'm only giving away the ending because it's a lie. Uh, he died of tuberculosis in some sanitarium. Or sanatorium. I always get those two mixed up. I don't know if there are three things in this entire movie that are true. But the funny thing is, back in the 90s when Tombstone came out... I didn't believe one word of that movie. I'm like, nothing like this ever happened. There wasn't no Johnny Ringo who could spout Latin. No one was anybody's Huckleberry. No, nope. and then I found out one day a lot of it was true. Maybe John Ford was saying that his film was the most true to the spirit of actual events. Possibly. If they just changed all the names, I would have enjoyed it a thousand times more. Well, it's a good thing that John Ford isn't here right now, because he would be punching you he in would, the face. Oh my god, he would pry out my eye and take it as his own. <laughs> he does have the depth perception problem, so yeah. he might not be able to get you. No, he'd find me. Come up to the window, take off his shoes. Yep. <laughs> he was a master cat burglar and murderer, John Ford. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good, it might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to the basement. How's my hair? Beautiful. Thank you. Lustrous. Are, are you sure sometimes it looks good down there and then I'm watching it at home and I'm... I have given up trying to determine what your opinions are. That's good. Thank you. Welcome back to the basement, Craig. I hope you had a good hiatus. It's great to be back. It's the beginning of a new season and I want season four to start off with a bang. I want to grab our audience and not let them go. How do you do that? You need a special kind of movie. A movie that's a little outrageous, maybe a bit of a cult film, a movie unlike any you have ever seen before. We need to go beyond reason, beyond expectation, beyond the Valley of the Dolls. <laughs> I'll hand it over. Released in 1970, B-T-V-O-T-D was originally intended as a sequel to the 1967 film Valley of the Dolls, starring Sharon Tate and Patty Duke. It was instead rewritten as a parody of that film. According to screenwriter Roger Ebert, yes, that one, it was, quote, a satire of Hollywood conventions, genres, situations, dialogue, characters, and success formulas, unquote. Very well said, Roger. We'll, we'll see how that pans out for you. Yes. Dolls, in this case, is not just a slang term for a lady, but also a slang term for downers, which itself is a slang term for big sleepies, which is a slang term that I just made up. <laughs> I'm talking about pills. Yeah, pills, man. Barbiturates sleeping pills. Yeah, the droopy dogs. This is our second X-rated film here on the show. Our first was Fritz the Cat. <laughs> Can't be worse than that. <laughs> we'll find out. Oh, no. When director Russ Meyer found out that his film had received an X rating, he immediately wanted to re-edit the film to include more nudity and sex. Did he? Unfortunately, Fox wanted to rush the film into release, so he didn't have time. And we are the poorer for it. Is this a bad movie? Uh, by most accounts, yeah, probably. But is it a good movie? A lot of people consider this to be one of their favorite movies. I don't know the answer. But what I wish for you here at the top of 2015 is a year filled with good movies for you to watch. Or even to make. Ooh. Oh, it's heavy. <laughs> it's a book called How to Make Good Movies. You could finally bring the true story of the OK Corral to the screen. <laughs> yes. Safeguards Against Heat and Humidity. Travelers to the South can take comfort in the fact that all Cinecodec films in magazines are always tropical packed. <laughs> Wonder if this is made by, by Kodak camera. Probably. Yeah. All right, step through that beaded curtain, walk across that shag carpet over to the old groovy leather couch for the 1970s movie freakout known as Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. Oh man. Are you on a stone cold bummer? No, oh, this is the worst. I just need to listen to some mellow stuff. I don't know what I'm doing, man. Nice. Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. It kind of sounds like a Sid and Marty Croft production. <laughs> a big bosomed woman is being menaced by a Nazi. <laughs> Music by Stu Phillips. 
Stu Phillips, hey, how do you like my music? You're branching out, Stu. Yeah, I wanted it to be exciting. Cut to somewhere in western Texas. Rock and roll will disguise any horror. The Kelly Affair, an all-female rock bland. Rock bland. That's kind of appropriate. An all-female rock band plays a senior prom. Kelly, Casey, and Pet. Harris, their manager, looks on. They retire to their van for some grass. Don't bogart the joint. I just heard this term. Kelly and Harris have a little makeout session. They're boyfriend and girlfriend. And so we go to Los Angeles. Kelly goes to a studio where there's all kinds of nudes and crazy colors and things. Kelly has a long lost aunt who lives in LA and she's a very successful advertising woman. Susan Lake, Porter Hall, her stuffy financier is also there. They get together for dinner and Susan informs Kelly that she is the heir to the family fortune. She's set to inherit one third of a million dollars. We're going to a party tonight, it's gonna to be great. It's at Z-Man's house. You know, the rock producer. Kelly says, can I invite my friends? Of course you can invite your friends. Uh, there's a telephone in the living room, uh, and I think that Ronnie's uh, address is in my book under the bees. My book under the bees. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to go to this party. <laughs> uh. They meet Z-Man. Emerson Thorne, promising law student. Ashley St. Ives, she works in pornography, thank you very much. Lance Rock. And you meet around a thousand other people who are in various states of undress, some of them having sex, lots of them doing drugs, all of them dancing. Z-Man is very excited by this party. In fact, This is my happening and it freaks me out. Hmm? We'd like some grass pot. And we would rather you not bogart it for us. Pet's looking around the house and she runs into, quite literally, Emerson. That's called a cute meat in the biz. He's looking for the John. He doesn't have a John in the kitchen. Then maybe I was looking for a sandwich. This ain't no welfare line. Then what are you standing in it for? A scene between black people that only Roger Ebert could write. <laughs> she kisses him right there over the broken glass. Now let's go to the bathroom and get that sandwich. Only a little makeout session between Count Dracula and Mary Wilson Craft Shelley here. Z Man reminds me of someone. Someone I'm sitting on this couch with right now. <laughs> You've got a little bit of the Z Man in you. Well, I'll start working on that for Halloween. <laughs> Z Man insists that the Kelly affair give a performance. So they kick the strawberry alarm clock to the curb for a minute, and the Kelly affair does one of their songs. <laughs> I'm so excited by what I've just heard. I'm double freaked out. And he renames them The Carry Nations. You'll be superstars. All right, I'm going to be a producer. Let's go. You can lean on. They're good, but they ain't no shags. They also ain't the Tammies. Don't know that one? No. Not a music fan? <laughs> Why do you keep saying that about me, Matt? <laughs> the newly named band then goes and performs for a live audience, and they are a hit. It's the last flight to Shangri-La leaves within the hour. Basin, basin. Get the basin. Oops, plop, get the mop. <laughs> oh, hi, babe. Coming to the party tonight? What party? Harris is too much of a sad sack, man. Yeah, he, he, is. he needs to get with it. Turn that frown upside down. Yeah, you're in La La Land, man. <laughs> There once was a time, maybe you can remember, when I was your manager, not the next thing to a goddamn groupie. That's a terrible limerick. <laughs> they have to find people to have sex with. Kelly goes off and sleeps with Lance Rock, and Harris goes and has sex with the vampiric Ashley St. Ives. Ah! Lance Rock hears about all that money that Kelly's going to inherit, and he says, why do you settle for a third? You should get half a million. Kelly goes to Susan Lake's office. I'll take half a million dollars, man. What was that? But the lawyer, he doesn't like it at all. Up yours, Ratso. Not a single penny. Porter Hall calls up Kelly and apologizes. He says, oh, I didn't mean any of those terrible things I said about you. Let's meet and discuss your inheritance. They go to a bar. Uh, I can remember when my father raised the Dickens over me. Yep, in my day, they called it the Dickens. And in the days of Dickens, they also called it the Dickens. <laughs> in any event, I didn't ask you to meet me today simply to apologize. I, uh... I want what's breast for the both of us. Uh, yeah, I... Me, uh... And he tries to pawn her off with a lousy $50,000. Take the 50000 leave us alone. So she invites Porter back to her place to try and seduce him for some reason. 
He gets into bed with his frumpy underwear. It's gross. Porter is unable to close the deal, as it were. He is getting on in years. There's a heavyweight champion boxer at the party, Randy. He don't need no shirt. They don't make shirts for a man with that money muscles. What? what are you doing here all alone, baby? Don't worry about me. I got a real nice old man. You get a nice old man. What's your nice old man got to do with me? I got a nice old man. I'm not trying to hear that, see? If you don't live for now, why you might as well just roll over and take the full count. I only speak in boxing metaphors. Let's go back to my corner. And I will spit in your bucket. <laughs> Harris and Ashley are on the beach. They're making furious makeouts, and Harris isn't having it. He's bored. Oh, Ashley, stop bringing me to orgasm. <laughs> Ashley informs him. You're a lousy lay. You'll never get into one of my films, sweetheart. <laughs> Harris returns to the party. He sees Lance Rock. He knows what he's been doing with Kelly. He picks a fight with him. Punches are thrown, and Harris is defeated. You'd make a great switch hitter, sweetheart. So why don't the two of us... Fortunately, Z-Man can only be truly hurt by a wooden stake yes. to the heart. Or by some scathing invective. <laughs> Harris, despondent, goes over to Casey's house. There are juice freaks and there are pill freaks. And everybody's a freak. What you need is grass or a downer or something. Ah, the dolls yeah. that the title of the movie has promised. Finally, they end up having sex. Did you enjoy yourself? What the hell are you talking about? God damn it, you're like all the rest. Kicks Harris out. Pet and Randy get it on. Alston Emerson. And Emerson walks in on it. Oh man, he's so sad. Emerson and Randy get into it outside. <laughs> there was a distinct snapping noise. TJ Hooker! <laughs> Randy runs over Emerson with his car and leaves. He and Pet's romance is rekindled. Carrie Nation are having their TV debut. A depressed Harris looks on from the rafters and does this. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Talk about a downer. The doctor says he'll live, but he'll be a paraplegic for the rest of his life. Maybe. Casey's pregnant with Harris's kid. She consults Roxanne, who's some woman, possibly works in fashion. I don't know. Roxanne says, you should get an abortion. I know a doctor that can help you. I don't want an abortion. No, he's a pediatrician. He's going to help you. I don't know about it. This is the only time Harris can ever have a kid because, you know, he has no spinal column anymore. So they go off to get Casey an abortion. You'll be just as good as new. <laughs> Me no like that smash cut. Pet and Emerson are enjoying some pancakes one morning. Hey, remember when I got hit by that car? Me neither. <laughs> when Randy the boxer returns, Pet pulls a knife and Randy leaves. Casey discovers a new way to make love with her friend Roxanne. They begin an affair, made entirely out of love. This comes up again later. This movie has everything. Ronnie Z-Man has decided to have another party. This one's more private. It's a small, intimate affair involving costumes and lots of peyote. His bartender is dressed as a Nazi. Let us see, jungle lad. Hey, Rube, to your party, let's do it. Everybody gets high. <laughs> Casey and Roxanne go off and they make love. Boy, lesbian sex looks painful. You That's why I never have it. <laughs> And Z-Man tries to seduce Lance Rock. To the embodiment of carnal desire. Carnal desire, my ass. Yes, that's the plan. <laughs> you want to know something else? I'm going to take a downer and crash. And then nothing bad could happen to me. <laughs> that's perfect. All the easier to tie you up with. Oh, also, Z-Man is not a man at all. He's actually a woman. You've been abroad all along, right, Barzell? <laughs> Goddamn broad! Z-Man goes full on berserk, pulls out a sword. <laughs> Z-Man goes on a rampage. He kills the Nazi. Oh, wait, this is the beginning of the movie. That's right, you've seen this before. He kills Roxanne with a gun. <laughs> that was pretty graphic. We probably should have warned you about that. Casey calls her band and says, come and help me, Z-Man's crazy. Because evidently this is before the police had a telephone line in Los Angeles. They bring along Harris because they're equal opportunity. They drive over there, but they are too late. <laughs> Pet takes a bullet to the shoulder, 
and they make him shoot himself, and Z-Man's dead. Look, Kelly. His legs are working now. I can feel my legs. And then, lessons. For our actions affect the lives and destinies of the many. Z-Man, he forgot that life has many levels. Lance Rock, he never gave of himself. Casey and Roxanne, theirs was not an evil relationship. But evil did come because of it. Each decide what your life will be. You must always know that a hand extended to your fellow man is a gesture of love. Love that asks nothing. It is simply there. This is really inspiring, Craig. Yeah. I feel like a freeze frame ending. Me too. There are juice freaks, pill freaks, everybody is a freak. I wouldn't have believed that up until now, but after seeing this film, I do. Yes, everyone's a freak in the movie, even those who don't want to be freaks. It feels watching this movie that we are in the middle of a longer story, where we haven't seen Valley of the Dolls, the movie that this is spoofing, yet we get to see Rocky Horror Picture Show, which is a movie that seems to draw off something from this movie. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And various other movies, like Boogie Nights, seem to pick up stuff from this movie as well. So it seems to be kind of like this prism that, like, took Valley of the Dolls and then just shot it out onto the world. If you had Valley of the Dolls, I'd sit down and watch it right now, just so I can connect the dots. And this movie, not as bad as I thought it was going to be. No, it was really fun. It's fun and it moves really quickly. Mm -hmm. I was surprised at how fast the cuts went in this. In Roger Ebert's book, Life Itself, he talks about when he first saw Russ Meyer and he said that this wasn't just some schlock exploitation man. This guy was an actual auteur who was working in exploitation, using shots in creative ways to, you know, make women look more powerful. There's that shot on the beach where sure. Ashley is standing with a night sky behind her. It's like, Jesus, it's like the attack of the 50-foot woman there. It's, it was amazing. If you could pick a single frame that, like, sums up Russ Meyer's entire career, it's yeah. that. When did the Manson murders happen? 1969. Okay. So I think that that very much affected this movie. Right. Someone after Manson... That Z-Man reminded me of. A guy who shot a woman in his house years later. Yeah. Phil Spector. I don't want to say it's funny that Spector's story ended up with murder at his secluded mansion, but it is funny. Prescient. Prescient. The women in this are unbelievable. Yeah. But... The sex and the sexiness is not very sexy. I don't know. I'd call it sexy. There's no attempt to genuinely arouse the audience. It's just like the movie's just being naughty. It seems very juvenile. It is juvenile. I don't but mind. while I was watching it, I was remembering being a juvenile and how much I would have loved this movie as a juvenile. Yeah, yeah. I think that all movie critics should make a movie in one way or another. James Agee was a movie critic, and yeah. he wrote African Queen. That worked out great. Oh, yeah. Rex Reed, he starred in Myra Breckenridge. That worked out horribly. And I think it's good so that you can call them out on their hypocrisy as time goes on. I'm just going to say right now, Roger, you didn't like Blue Velvet? You didn't like Blue Velvet? Final thoughts on Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. If you like breasts, check it out. It should have won Breast Picture in 1970. It's like the Ben-Hur of breast movies. Yeah, it is. Don't take pills, just watch Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. It's kind of a similar experience. If you haven't seen it, check it out. And don't keep a gun where you can find it when you're on the freakout drugs. Well, as you move beyond the Valley of the Dolls, keep on going till you get to our website. Welcome to TheBasementShow.com. You can see all of our episodes. You can read brilliant essays that Craig has written. And there's a PayPal donation button. You can click it and donate some money to support our show. A lot of really now people donated to the show. And here are their names. Mara, who says, Happy Holidays and a good start to the new year. Yeah. Cindy, who says, here is $5 for Ernesto to go buy some catnip. Smooches. You hear that, boy? Yeah, get all hopped up on catnip. It's right. the Valley of the Kitties. Jamil. Victoria. Michael, who says, keep up the top flight entertainment. Vishal, who says, been watching the show since number one and have enjoyed the ride ever since. Pella. Matthew. Peter. Gregor. All the best from Austria. Hey. Robbie, who says, greetings from Germany. I'm stationed over here right now in the Air Force, and during work, myself and other airmen discuss movies often, and I've gotten others hooked on the show, and it is definitely raises our morale with your comedy and in-depth movie discussions. All right. Go Air Force. And Adam, who says, Use guys is all right. Use guys is also all, all right. 
I can't forget to thank our monthly donors. These people have set up rolling monthly donations, and their names are Corey, Martha, Patricia, Stephanie, Jason, Stephanie, Edward, Lee, George, Patrick, Joe, Steve, Alexander, and Michael. You can set up a monthly rolling donation by going to our website and doing that. It can be as little as a dollar or two. It still makes a difference. But what if someone wanted to just send us a letter? Well, you can send it to this address. Letters, postcards, packages, things you got lying around the house, whatever. And now, this is my scene it, and it's freaking me out. Whoa. <laughs> T.A. Epley, scene it, brain candy. I'll bet Matt has. And I would love to hear his thoughts on the movie and its shortcomings. How is it that Monty Python transitioned from the small to the big screen so triumphantly while the kids in the hall foundered? Seen it. Seen it. I don't even know how much box office it did here in the States. It's not even a cult movie. It's very few people love brain candy. I'm one of them. I thought it was great. Oh, I, did. I thought it was really inventive. I thought the framing device worked. You know, it really had a cohesive feel. I thought it was cohesive, but not funny. It was too nihilistic, and you could really sense the fact that Dave Foley wasn't really present yeah. for it. But I, I still think it worked. Andrew Vogt says, you should watch Charade with Audrey Hepburn and Cary Grant. So many twists the way they should be done. Seen it. Seen it. A great non-Hitchcock Hitchcock movie. Audrey Hepburn and her husband's killed at the beginning of the movie, and she keeps throwing herself at Cary Grant, which is something that Cary Grant demanded, uh, because he's like, I'm 25 years older than this woman. I can't be hitting on her, or else it'll turn off the audience. Um, So it's kind of progressive that way. And never once do they play charades. No. Michael McKelvin, Three Amigos, overrated and never had me caring about the leads. Seen it. Seen it. And you know what, Michael? I agree with you. This movie never really did it for me. And back then, when I was a teenager, movies like this were my jam. Mm -hmm. Really silly, broad comedy. I just never found it funny in the same way that I never found Spaceballs funny. Spaceballs, yeah. I think that Three Amigos is better than Spaceballs, but I think that Three Amigos is a movie that's fun to quote. More fun to quote than to watch. Yeah. Oh, Sing Butch, or a plethora of pinatas. Would you say it's a plethora? It's like, that's always funny to me. You know, Michael is really right. I mean, you you don't care about the leads. There's no stakes in the movie. And I know the the movie's supposed to be like a farce. Mm -hmm. It's this very broad, joke-based movie. I guess you can only take that so far. Just because it's a joke-based movie doesn't mean you can't care about the actors because you care about the guys in Stripes. You care about the guys in Ghostbusters. Victor Frankenstein. Yeah. 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 You care about the Marx Brothers. Maybe that was a problem. They shouldn't have done it in a desert. It looked like a miserable shoot. Well, then they couldn't do the joke with the canteen. and See, that that bit is funny Mm -hmm. with the canteen. Yeah. But, eh. Lip balm? (laughs) I can reminisce and laugh about it, but if I watch that movie right now, I'd be miserable. Speaking of Spaceballs, Adam Lemma writes, Seen it? It happened one night? Yes, seen it. Seen it. It happened one night is the plot of Spaceballs. Rich woman... Runs away from her wedding, gets picked up by some narrow to well. She makes her a better person. He brings her home. Everything down to picking up the reward and just asking for fuel. That's the exact same plot as it happened one night. Except for one thing. It happened one night is amazing and it's one of the funniest movies ever. Holds up 70 years later. We'll talk about a comedy where you care about the leads. Definitely. And it is the prototype for every romantic comedy since then. She meets the guy. She doesn't like him. Oh, how could I ever like this guy? No, I like him. And it's like, you're a stuck-up, arrogant woman. I'm never going to like you. Alex Michael Jones writes, I'm sure you have both seen it, but I would love to hear your take on Ron Howard's A Beautiful Mind. It is one of my favorite movies of all time. Seen it. Seen it. It's good. The problem with the movie is that it won Oscar for Best Picture. Why is that a problem? Because it just sets up everyone to go, well, it wasn't the best picture of that year. It would have a lot more fans if it didn't win Best Picture because it's the movie that beat Mulholland Drive, Hmm. which is an incomprehensible masterpiece that would never win Best Picture because that's not how the Oscars work. I remember not thinking much of it. All I remember is that speech at the end, and he says the phrase, A Beautiful Mind, and it just seemed really corny to me. Oh, you're ending the movie on this note? Well, it's probably from the speech. (laughs) Yeah, well, I don't (laughs) like it anyway. That's seen it. And that's our show. Thanks for joining us for the psychedelic freakout known as Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. We had a good time. We hope you did, too. We give it one of these and one of these, but we're not saying it out loud for legal reasons. Join us next time, the day before Valentine's Day. That's mine and Craig's date night. We're going to watch a romantic movie together. 
I'm looking forward to it. Before we go, I have a little bit of sad news to bring up. Uh, we suffered a loss here in the basement recently. Our little cat, Tiger, passed away over the hiatus. She was not as active on camera as Ernesto, uh, the sort of unofficial mascot of the show. But she did show up occasionally. She did. So I want to take a look back on some of Tiger's moments here on the show. Hope you enjoy. I want my own house! <laughs> Right, I get more cats in a toilet seat. <laughs> Mr. Regency and I make out five times a night. Happy Halloween, everyone. <laughs> Turn the thing off. <laughs> I... Meow! <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching, everybody. Good night. Good night. Hey, don't don't <laughs> let it take you too far. <laughs> Time to play the feud, apparently. <laughs> 100 people surveyed, top two answers on the board. What are Russ Meyer's two favorite things? <laughs> this is my happening and it freaks me out.